Briefcase Crimes contains graphic depictions of violent acts, bad jokes, and loud dog noises. It's not intended for all audiences, and listener discretion is advised. listeners to briefcase crimes i'm hannah and i'm full of terrifying facts about horrific events i'm liz and i'm full of morbid curiosity hannah elizabeth welcome to february monthly mystery do 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 so (laughs) i tried well i didn't really try to but when i was deciding what case to do I found one that happens on Valentine's Day. Wow. I know. So, that's what we're going to do today. And the monthly mystery will be going up two days before Valentine's Day. Is that right? Yeah, it'll be on the 12th. No, it's Monday, so it'll be the 8th. It'll be the week before. Oh, yes, it will. Sorry. I'm still on our Friday uploads. Yeah, that's okay. Instead of Monday uploads. I figured close enough, you know. Yes. I mean, it's seasonally appropriate. Right. Exactly. So, this case is known as the Pitchfork Murder or the Witchcraft Murder, depending on who you're asking. Mm -hmm. Nice. Nice. It takes place in England. Okay. In, let me see which year. It's 1945. Okay. So, right at the end of World War II. Yes. Which is, like, somewhat relevant, but, like, not super relevant. Mm Mm-hmm. So, our main protagonist in this case is... On our first slide. Okay. His name is Charles Walton. Okay. He is 74 years old. He is a retired farm laborer. He is a widower with uh, no children. Uh, He rents part of a cottage. So this is the cottage shown um, in like an older photo. I don't have an exact date on that black and white photo. Um, And then as it is today. It is so cute. So back when it was like three different apartments. um, So he rented one of the three sections with his niece who was named Edith or Edie. She was 33 years old and Charles actually adopted her when she was three years old because her mother passed away. So, um, the two of them live in this apartment in this adorable little cottage in Lower Quinton, which, if you go to your next slide. Is it a map? Yes, it's a map. (laughs) Ooh, I love a map. So, this is where Lower Quinton is. Um, Okay. It is part of, I'm going to say this wrong if I don't read it, so let me find it. Warwickshire, England. Warwickshire. Warwickshire. There we go. Yeah. It's part of Warwickshire, England. That's the probably last time I'm going to say Warwickshire. Warwickshire. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's a small village there. <laughs> um, he lived in Lower Quinton for his entire life. Okay. He is retired, but even so, he still works on some of the local farms. Um, but as he is 74 years old, he ha- now has arthritis, and even though he's really active still, he does use a walking stick. That's he's gonna not, come back. I assume he's not 74 in that picture. I don't think so. I think that's just the only photo that they okay. had. But okay. that's Charles. Yeah. Okay. So. There is a, you have the sign here that looks like a, a modern sign. It says, Lower Qu- Quinton, please drive carefully, and I can't see the symbol in it. 
um, on the bottom it says this is a something area. Oh, but at I first I just I just read it as this is a area. Duh. <laughs> and then I was like, okay. What is that? What does that say now? I don't know. It's too blurry. I don't know. Oh, you, you make big. I, I, I did don't make big. I don't um, know. Could be like anything. Yeah. Could literally be anything. Pretty much. It is an area, though. It's an area. Not an area. A area. Oh, no. <laughs> this is an area. That, too. Okay. Back to Charles. Charles. So, Charles. He's a loner, but he is pretty much well-liked in the village. Um, This village is kind of really, or I guess the whole area of Warwickshire is kind of like they they like legends they like their folklore they like i don't know they it's like the goss you know like hot goss okay um so most people really liked him he kept to himself most of the time but some people reported weird things happening around him so for example crows were said to flock to him so that he could feed them from his hand which to me is just like he likes to feed the birds and crows are smart so they know that crows are real smart they know but you know um they also said that he was able to tame wild dogs just with the sound of his voice and milan i guess (laughs) and he was also a renowned horse trainer when he was younger so he has like these gifts with animals. He's a druid. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> um, he was just kind of your typical country farm guy. Mm-hmm. But some people thought that these traits of him's traits of him. Him's, <laughs> <laughs> him's <laughs> traits. That's what I get for reading ahead as I'm trying to talk. So these traits of his, some people thought that that meant he was involved with witchcraft. Why not? Right. Exactly. (laughs) Other people in town and probably the majority of the people in town were just like, no, he's just had a long life and he has wisdom in his old age. Like, he knows what he's doing. Yeah. I mean, especially with, like, horse training. Like, some people are just better at that than other people. Like, and also, like you said with the crows, like, crows knows yeah crows are not dumb no they've got ancient wisdom they're definitely one of the smartest birds that i know of yeah so they remember stuff yeah as far as like training like taming wild dogs with just the sound of your voice yeah how many wild dogs like are they fair i assume feral dogs you know when we went to the farming village in italy there were dogs like everywhere like just wild feral animals Hey man, my dad. I just visited my parents, and my dad said that they have a, a, <laughs> a possum in the neighborhood, <laughs> and he was like, "This possum is huge, Hannah." He was like, "This possum is the biggest possum I've ever seen." He was like, "It just walks around like it owns a place because what's gonna mess with it?" He's like, I'd "It's bigger it. than." He's like, "It's bigger than all the cats that run mm-hmm. around because they have a lot of like stray feral cats in town," and he was like, "It's bigger than all the cats." And my mom was like, I'm just afraid because, like, it goes in our yard. And what if Hazel's here and, like, it, it gets in a fight? And my dad was like, she, she'd get really messed up. She'd get, he was like, she'd lose. <laughs> oh, God. So apparently they have a huge, a huge uh, possum. I'll believe it when I see pictures of it. I yeah, want to see this, crypt, this cryptid possum that my <laughs> father has sighted. Possum man. Yeah. He said it's real big, but uh. he... He said he saw it coming and he had to take a double take to see what it was because it was so big. And I was like, we didn't take a picture of it. Like, I want to see how big this possum is. Mm -hmm. (sighs) So they they also had a possum just show up dead on their porch. (laughs) What? (laughs) He was like, I walked outside. There was just a dead possum on the porch. And I was like, what does that mean? I was like, what kind of omen is that? (laughs) Jeez. Yep. Well. That's this weird. This has been this has been possum possum talk. <laughs> All right, back to back to Charles. His niece Edith 
was quoted as saying he was friendly with everyone, but no one ever seemed to visit at the house. He didn't go out in the evenings and very seldom went to the public house, like a pub. Yeah. He was always happy and contented with his life. So, like, no enemies. He wasn't, like, out gambling. He wasn't out, you know, owing He's people old. money and stuff. He's just an old dude doing his old dude stuff. Yeah. So, like I said, Lower Quentin really likes legends. There's a lot of legends that kind of play into this story. So, I'm going to be bringing them up. Um, as we go along, uh, most of them have little to no evidence to support them as legends and usually go. Yeah, so, if they had evidence to support them, they wouldn't be legends. Yeah, exactly. They'd just be facts. But we will bring them up. Okay. So, the year is 1945, the day, Valentine's Day. We arrive on a hillside called Moen Hill located in Lower Quinton. Like any other day, Charles gets up in the morning and gets ready to go out to help tend farmland. He had a simple routine. Every day he took out his pitchfork, a bill hook, which is kind of like a machete, mm -hmm. um, and a piece of fruitcake for lunch. <laughs> okay. But for the past nine months, Charles had been working on the same farm, which was called the Furs, like fir mm -hmm. tree, F-I-R. Um, and this farm was owned by a man named Alfred Potter. Okay. So on this day, like any other, he got up, he headed out, he walked through the churchyard and up onto the hill to trim back the foliage and sh foliage and shrubs on Moen Hill, and he left at about 9 a.m. So, if And you... I assume Moen Hill is part of this farm? Yes. Okay, so... he's not just like, before I get there, I'll trim back these shrubs. No. <laughs> okay. No. So if you go to your map here. Oh, I thought, see... I thought from the thumbnail of this, this was going to be like a family tree for oh, some reason. Yeah, I can see okay. that. Um, so I actually got this image from a different podcast that covered this. Um, their watermarks up in the corner there. I was like so pleased to see yeah. that somebody had already put this map together. So shout out to darkstories.com podcast. Dark histories? I'm um, sorry, dark histories. Yes, That's thank okay. you. Um, there's one more map by them later on. But um, so this is showing the churchyard that he walked through and then the firs farm on the bottom right corner okay so moen hill had a lot of um legends about it it was said to be a site of devilish deeds and ancient hauntings uh one of the legends from the eighth century says that the devil kicked a boulder down from atop the hill intending to smash the recently built evesham abbey um the legend tells that this angry deed was stopped by the locals prayers and the stone instead fell on cleave hill outside cheltenham which i assume is like a neighboring town um People there then supposedly carved a cross into the stone to rid it of the evil from the devil's touch. Another version of this story says the devil threw a large clod of earth, like of the hill itself, to smother the newly built abbey. However, the Bishop of Worcester saw the devil and with, again, the power of prayer, <laughs> altered the devil's aim. Um... So in this version, oh, I see. In this version, this is me not reading fully and getting confused. So where he threw the clod of the earth, supposedly the clod fell short of the target and the clod of earth itself is Moen Hill. So. Okay. Weird hill creation he story. He really hates that abbey. Apparently. Um, there's also legends that phantom dogs of the Celtic king Erwin haunt or hunt on the hill at night. Um, I'm not going to get into that. 
but people see black dogs on the hill like all the time and they it like wigs them out okay so ghosts of a dog yeah so there's a whole lot of stuff about this hill if you go on to the next slide there is a picture of the hill wow this, this is the the devil's clod of dirt it is in all of its glory terrifying obviously it's like not even that tall of a hill no it's like a central pennsylvania mountain yeah so enough about the hill <laughs> yeah. uh edith charles's niece worked as a printer's assembly at the royal society for arts manufacturers and commerce which was located in their village she also had a pretty standard strict routine she arrived home from work on valentine's day in 1945 at 6 p.m but she found that charles was not home again he is a major creature of habit Mm -hmm. usually he would get home around 4 p.m so this was very unusual for him uh he rarely ever broke routine you know even if he ran into somebody who was like hey come have a drink or whatever like he never would so edith was reasonably very concerned Mm -hmm. she went over to the neighbor who was also a farmhand named harry beasley to see if he knew anything he did not, but he did agree to go with Edith, Edith in search for Charles. And she may not even been thinking of, like, foul play. No. Like, if he's in his 70s and he's and, out farming. And arthritic and, yeah. you know. Like, he might have just died. Yeah. That could be just a very valid concern. Right. So the first thing he did was go to the Furs, because obviously that's where he was supposed to be. Um, so that they could see if he was there and talk to Alfred Potter, who owned the farm. Mm -hmm. Potter said that he had seen Charles at noon while Charles was trimming brush, but that was the mm -hmm. last time he had seen him. The three of them then, Edith, Beasley, and Potter, made their way to the spot where Potter last saw him and discovered Charles's body brutally murdered. Wow. This case was to become the oldest unsolved murder in Warwickshire. So, right. Edith have was they just... considered that it might be? I have some. I have some theories already. Mm hmm. What do you got? One suspect number one, the devil. The devil. <laughs> suspect. Suspect number two phantom dogs oh yeah definitely the phantom dogs suspect or suspects number three crows but they but the crows like him you can never trust a bird elizabeth they'll turn on you in a heartbeat how many birds have turned on you hannah i don't go near birds i don't give them the give option them a I will say, I saw a video on TikTok the other day of a duck, a duck that was very excited to get a cup of ice water from Dunkin' Donuts. Mm -hmm. I saw that one too, the strawberry It was water. very, very, very cute. I liked it. I still don't like any bird, including ducks, but <laughs> yeah, it almost made me change my mind about birds. I that duck. That. It was I like that duck. Yeah. Ducks are bad. Ducks are bad news, man. Mm, they Ducks really are, are. They're aggressive. They're horny. They're yeah. the worst. Yeah. Mm, ducks. Mm -mm. I won't talk about. I won't talk about ducks. We're not. Anymore. We're not going to get into owls either. That's just not happening. I mean, owls are always a suspect. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it could have been any of those that I just said. Mm-hmm. The devil, probably suspect number one. Right. Uh, he was like, what are you doing on my dirt clod? Right, right. See, they didn't carve a, uh, a cross into the, the hill. They should have. No, they didn't. No wonder the dogs are there. Well, the Celtic dogs. What are you going to do, right? So. I don't know. How do you get rid of dogs? He was probably up there, and there was... Here's my my theory. He was on this demon hill, 
and there were some ghosts of Celtic dogs, mm-hmm. and they were like, what are you doing on my hill? And then he was like, I'm good at taming, training wild dogs. And they were like, but we're not normal dogs. He got cocky. The hubris of man. <laughs> okay, Hannah. <laughs> Please continue. Uh, all right. So they find his body. And it was brutal what happened to him. That's what phantom dogs will do. Oh, just you wait. We're going to, I'm going to describe it to you. Okay. So Edith is beside herself and she's just like screaming and crying hysterically. Beasley is trying to call, calm her down and get her down the hill so that she doesn't touch the scene and disrupt mm-hmm. anything. Potter is telling them that he's he flags by some passerby farmhand and tells them to go and get the police while he says he's going to stay there and guard the scene by okay. himself. Mm-hmm. So at this point, uh, graphic warning. There, I'm going to be very graphically description describing what happened to him. Mm-hmm. Um, and our next slide here is a crime scene photo, though mm-hmm. the photo is not super graphic. Um, but fair warning for that. So you can go ahead and flip to your next photo. Um, Charles's head had been severely beaten with his own walking stick. Oh my. Then his throat was slashed three times with his own bill hook. That was not apparently enough to satisfy the killer, as he then stabbed him in the chest with his pitchfork and finally rammed the pitchfork into his face, pinning him to the ground by his face. Oh. The billhook was still stuck in his throat. Well, lucky for this murderer that he brought all the implements. Yeah, yeah, he used all of his stuff. So, they did perform an autopsy on the body. (laughs) Okay. The autopsy showed that Charles tried to fight back. He did have defensive wounds on his arms. Legends state that a cross was carved in his chest, but that's not true. That was not in the autopsy report, at least. Um, But what is true is that his shirt was unbuttoned along with his pants. Some people think it might have been that he was attacked while he was relieving himself, but that doesn't, like, require your shirt to be undone, so it's still kind of, like, a little sketchy. Maybe he was hot. Well, that was another thing that was said, but it wasn't, it's February. Like, it's not hot season. But you can still get hot exerting yourself. Yeah, yeah. Something that was even weirder, though is that his belt had been removed from his pants and was laying across his legs. Hmm. So, like, even if he was relieving yourself, like, I don't think you'd completely remove your belt. I gotta pee. Better take off all my my clothes. (laughs) Yeah. So, the first officer on the scene, um, there's a lot of names here, and you know names are hard for me, so I'm gonna probably be using, like, a lot of titles instead of names. Mm -hmm. The That's first okay. officer was police constable Michael James Lamazny, who arrived a little after 7 p.m. So our timeline, um, we have Edith getting home at 6, them going, finding his body now at 7 p.m. This mm-hmm. constable has shown up on the scene. He is the first person. And then a little after 7 Detectives from a nearby town called Stratford upon Avon or Avon. Avon. Yeah. Late uh they arrived later in the evening, led by Detective Superintendent I'm about, I'm about <laughs> to give up. <laughs> I, I'm just I just I'm trying to read. I don't know why that hit me. It's so funny. I'm about to give up. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Trying again. Detective Superintendent Alec Spooner. 
arrived later on in the evening. Okay, cool. He got there. Dope. Moving past that one. <clears throat> later, like, so not that day, but, like, in later reports, the constable noted that Potter seemed very upset. The constable was quoted as saying he was shivering and complained of being cold. Looking back, I think that Potter appeared more worried than one would have expected him to be. His complaint of feeling cold I considered a strange excuse from one who is used to attending to animals at all hours and in all kinds of weather, especially as the murdered man was his own employee and had been murdered on his own land. Fair. Yeah, I guess. So then <laughs> this next thing, I'm just like, what? Initially, the constable also believed the case to be a suicide. I was going to joke about that earlier. Like, I was going to be like, and they rolled it a suicide. And, and I'm just like, how? Like, what I, pit even? I stabbed myself in the face with a pitchfork. Yeah, yeah. I stabbed myself in the chest with a pitchfork, sliced my own throat three times, and then pinned myself to the ground with said put pitchfork when it was all done. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, I think this constable might just, like, not be good at his job. <laughs> yeah. So, detectives also discovered he had a pocket watch chain, but no pocket watch. So, Ooh. at one point, they were thinking, maybe robbery gone wrong, but his pocket watch was only worth about 25 shillings, which is like 40 bucks today. But maybe it wasn't a robbery gone wrong. Maybe it was a trophy. Oh, maybe. Maybe That's it was a, I killed you, and now I have this thing to remember about killing you. Yeah. So then, at that point, the suspicion switched to a, quote, maniac or one of the Italian prisoners of war at a nearby camp. Uh, blame it on the Italians. So, if you go to your next slide, this map shows where the war camp was in relation to the farm. And it was very common for them to just let the POWs, like, out. To, like, chill. Um, <laughs> we'll get to it later, but they interviewed some of the POWs, and I'm just like, what even? Okay. But, but that's why they were kind of thinking that, because they were just kind of out and roaming a lot of the time. Okay. So, Detective Inspector Toombs began taking statements that night, interviewing Alfred Potter first. The farmer gave the background to his hiring of Charles and, like, what kind of work he was supposed to be doing on the hill. He said that he'd been working on the very last field that needed attention and that he added that he himself, uh, Potter himself, had been at the local pub, the College Arms, until noon. He then proceeded back to the farm and observed Charles at work. Potter <laughs> observed that Walton was almost complete in his task and that it would have taken only another 30 minutes to finish to the point that the hedge was now, placing the time of the attack a little after noon that day, February the 14th. Okay. Professor Webster, <laughs> there's a lot of people in this case, and, like, most of them don't really do all that much. Okay. Um, but Professor Webster was the next to arrive at the village, and the body of Charles was removed from the scene finally at 1.30 a.m. It was the next day, so the 15th, that the chief constable decided the case required the speciali specialist knowledge of the Metropolitan Police, which, like, thank God, because he was just going to be like, yeah, yeah, suicide. Yeah. You know. It's fine. Yeah. Case closed. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So, they called in Robert Fabian. 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 Who... He was a character, um, 
He retired shortly after this case. Like, he retired in 49, I think it was, and then went on to write books. He published a book called The Anatomy of Crime, in which he account he recounted this case in that book. And okay. I didn't read the book, but according to uh, the book and according to people who have read it, his his account of the case is sensational at best. Okay. So, you know, he – it's said that he really did – thorough work on this case but i guess he just sensationalized it for his book well you gotta sell books in his book he said and i probably should be reading this after i talk about how thoroughly he investigated but i'm gonna say it first (laughs) that's fine this is our show exactly (laughs) in the anatomy of crime when he talked about this murder he said I advise anyone who is tempted at any time to venture into black magic, witchcraft, witchcraft shaman, witchcraft. I know I'm struggling today. Uh, witchcraft shamanism that call it what you will to remember Charles Walton and to think of his death, which was clearly the ghastly climax of a pagan rite. There is no stronger <laughs> argument for keeping as far away as possible from the villains and their swords, incense and mumbo jumbo. It is prudence on which your future peace of mind and even your life could depend. In this pagan ritual, was it like, find somebody on a hill, kill them using the things that they have? Like, right. it's not very... Uh... Maybe it's very specific, and it's like, find a man on a hill. He has a pitchfork. (laughs) He's got a walking stick. (laughs) Okay, so Fabian arrived in the village on the 16th of February, and he was accompanied by Detective Sergeant Albert Webb. The duo took command of the case, and later on were um, speaking with uh, the prisoners of war in the camp. Like, that okay. was one of the first things that they did. So, this was, the interviews were done by, they, they called in an Italian-speaking detective to conduct the interviews. So, his that name is, sense. yeah, so his name is Saunders. He's the Italian-speaking detective. So he interviewed them, and he found that the prisoners were basically allowed to roam freely around the area, like I mentioned. And it says, while it might seem unusual to modern sensibilities, it wasn't an uncommon practice at the time, particularly regarding Italian prisoners. On the day of the killing, some of the prisoners of war had visited Stratford to watch a play, and others had seen a film at the cinema there. So they were just like out and about. <laughs> Sounds different from yeah. like other prisoner of war stories we have. Yeah. Like I don't it, think John McCain was allowed to just go see a movie. No, I don't think so. And like I was really surprised because when I first started reading it, I was like, oh man, like World War Two prisoners of war. Like it's going to be real serious. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like. I mean, being a prisoner of war, no matter what the type of imprisonment is, would not be fun. Right. But, I mean, this is definitely not a high security, you know, great escape style prisoner (laughs) prisoner of war camp. Yeah. So, they pretty much at this point ruled out the prisoners of war. Um, They tried lots of things in order to find more clues. Uh, They set up their HQ in Stratford-upon-Avon because they had, like, a really big map of the area. So they were trying to, like, track the movements of everybody involved, you know, track alibis. I know. Um, (laughs) I just like the idea of, like, we set up here because they had a big map. They had a big map. I know. Um, they also had aerial photos taken by a plane that they used 
in order to do the tracking. Uh, and there was a man who was arrested for hiding in a ditch with blood on his hands. Okay. And they initially looked at him as a suspect, but they eventually wrote him off. Um, just, they called him a mere poacher. Oh, okay. Yeah. So So it wasn't human blood. Yeah, so they were like, okay, he's hiding in a ditch. He might not be all right, like, in the head, but, like, it's, it's, he's a poacher, so it's not. Well, he's, prob- he's probably not the guy. Was h- hiding in a ditch because poaching is illegal. Yeah. And there's all these cops here now. Right. So, there wasn't a record of movements of that guy, but again, they just wrote him off. And Fabian and Webb were basically completely drawn to Potter as a suspect. Mm-hmm. So well, he was they, cold. Yeah, he was cold. <laughs> so they <laughs> interviewed him a second time. And he began to divulge new information that may, you know, shed more light, including the fact that he thought that Charles may have been swindling him. So... Basically, Potter had just, you know, good old honor system that Charles was reporting the correct amount of hours worked back to him. Mm -hmm. But he started to suspect that Charles was embellishing his hours a little bit and that, you know, he was overpaying him. So Potter then reiterated that he left the pub at noon. Around 12.20 had seen Walton while he was on his way back to the farm. Potter said he did not greet Walton as he had a heifer that required his attention. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So then suspicion of Potter got even stronger when the constable informed them that they were going to be looking for fingerprints on the billhook. And then Mm. all of a sudden, Potter remembered that he had touched the handle of the instrument while he was waiting for the police to arrive. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. To ensure that he was truly deceased. No, because he made such a big deal about not letting Edith touch anything. Yeah. Mm -mm. So. Mm -mm. This guy did it. Potter's (laughs) wife whose name is Lillian Potter. What British names? I know. So Potter's wife was immediately upset. She's saying that the police would surely now suspect him because he said this to them. Uh, He also started to, like, really insist that it must have been the Italian prisoners. So his insistence was making them, you know, feel even more sketchy as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but all said and done, his his alibi was pretty airtight or watertight. Um, he had a farmhand who was also named Charles, um, Charles Henry, who they refer to as the Happy Bachelor, and his wife both were confirming his alibi. Whoa, whoa, wait, whoa, wait. (laughs) Yes. Whoa. Charles Henry and Charles Henry's wife? Or Charles Henry and Potter's wife. wife. Okay, I was like, how is he a bachelor? First of all, I need to know, who's calling him the Happy Bachelor? Was that his nickname? Like, there goes the Happy Bachelor. Yeah, yeah, that's just his nickname. Weird. Yeah. But I was going to say, how is he a bachelor if he has a wife? I also wonder if that's, like, a confirmed bachelor. Maybe he was a gay. Maybe. It just, it has happy in quotations and then bachelors not, so I don't know. So maybe he wasn't happy. <laughs> Quote, happy is in gay, maybe? I don't, know. Mm, I don't have any idea. Anyways, his sexual orientation has nothing to do with the story, really. I just am very confused by the nickname. <laughs> that's Okay. The happy bachelor was happy to confirm that he had joined Potter pulping some marigolds 
mangolds i don't freaking know i was like i don't know what a mangold is but i know what a marigold is um (laughs) before they yeah i don't know what i didn't look it up before um they headed to look at the church clock by which they knew it was exactly 1 p.m Lillian Potter likewise confirmed the account, noting that her husband had inquired about lunch after reading his newspaper and hearing it wouldn't be long, joined Bachelor for the pulping. So, it's like um it's like Swiss chard. Oh, okay. There we go. It's a root vegetable. So the account, however, of Potter only seeing Walton on his way back from the pub contradicts his claims of pulping the mangolds i also think it's really convenient that the alibi is given by your wife who's afraid that they're going to arrest you yeah and another excuse me and another one of your employee right employees <laughs> then of course edith was like whoa wait a second you told us that you saw him at noon because you went to go cut some hay in the field. Hmm. So, and then, and of course, that... You don't cut con- hay with a heifer in, vo- in tow. I was just going to say, and then that contradicts Potter's initial statement about the heifer. So now there's three stories regarding where he was at the time of the murder. Even though one of them was being supported by his wife and his employee. So then this is like the kicker with his alibis. They then found out that the heifer that he claimed to have needed to attend to was found dead, having been drowned in the doomsday ditch. I'm not quite sure what the doomsday ditch is, but it's like a ditch in the area. I have so many questions. But it was found dead drowned the day before on february 13th (gasps) what so the carcass of the cow was only removed from the farm on the 14th with removal about happening at 3 30 p.m hours after walton had been killed uh and like what like like potter what are you doing lying yeah can you imagine being so mad so mad that somebody is lying about their hours that you do all of this no i cannot actually capitalism strikes again (laughs) so then (laughs) so then harry beasley if we remember harry beasley is the one who the neighbor who escorted Mm -hmm. edith also contradicted Peter or Potter, excuse me, saying that he he was sure that Potter can only have concluded that Walton was dead immediately given the state of the corpse. He said he never told him to check the the blade, to touch yeah. the blade, even though it was Potter's claim that he did it upon Beasley's uh instruction. So Beasley was adamant that Potter did not touch the blade in his presence. The bill hook. So, yeah. despite and why all that, would that tell you if he was alive? I, you would I think that the pitchfork through his face would have been enough to be like, yeah, he's dead. Yeah, I don't know. So, all of that... All of the alibis changing, all of the I said I touched it, no, I didn't touch it, I didn't tell him to touch it, all of that just for them to find no fingerprints at all on the (laughs) blade. Wow. So. But had he kept his mouth shut and they didn't find any fingerprints, then they wouldn't have any reason to suspect him. No. Other he, than his weird stories that aren't He definitely fitting. just incriminated himself. Yeah. So, he obviously employed people in the town. Uh, Beasley, who who was also an, em- an employee, said that Potter was a decent boss. However, other employees said that he occasionally had difficulties paying their wages. Um, mm. And... Money actually turned out to be 
a big deal with this case. Uh, also because Charles was a widower. And when his wife passed away in 1927, she left him a sum of 297 pounds, which is over 12,000 pounds in modern currency. Mm -hmm. He placed the money in a building society, like a building and loan, basically. Mm -hmm. Yet when police investigated, they found he only had two pounds to his name. Despite working his whole life and being noted for being super frugal, his money was never accounted for. Which That's is gone. weird. So, after Potter said that he may not have been actually working all the hours he said he was, uh, Detective Fabian made sure to check the books, and he concluded that what Potter was actually doing was trying to cover his back because he had been embezzling wages. Oh. So well, that's nice. So not only do we have him lying about alibis, but we have him embezzling funds from the Potter and Co., like his farm corporation. Uh but yeah, he so he was not paying Walton. Hmm. Yeah. So, a good guy. A stand-up guy. So, with all of that said, I'm going to go back a little bit to some more legends. Okay. So... There were a lot of legends of witchcraft in Lower Quinton. And, like I said before, a, a small population of the town believed Charles to be involved in witchcraft. Mm -hmm. And there was some, like, not good reason for this, but you can kind of, like, see the yeah. thought process. If so, you follow their logic, it, it makes sense. Yeah. So in Spooner's investigations, he found this book that I, it didn't really explicitly say, but I got the impression that the book itself was in Charles's home because there were excerpts from it that were like underlined and marked. Okay. So he found this book called Old Customs and Superstitions in Shakespeare Land by J. Harvey Bloom. The book had one passage which was underlined and stated that in 1875, a weak-minded young man killed a woman named Anne Tennant with a hay fork, so a pitchfork, mm -hmm. because he believed she had bewitched him. A second book, uh, Warwickshire by Clive Holland, had more details on this particular case. And it said that Anne, at the age of 80, after she left home to buy a loaf of bread, meeting some local farmhands on her way back, the woman was set upon without warning by James Haywood. Haywood attacked Tennant with a pitchfork, stabbing her in the legs and head. Despite claims, she hadn't been pinned to the ground, like with Walton. Um... Haywood had been familiar with the Tennant family for many years, as was described in uh, a another book. Um, he had been drinking and committed murder in full view of two witnesses. Cool. The <laughs> case was seemingly a combination of alcohol and potential mental illness, with Haywood claiming after his arrest that Tennant had been a witch and part of a local coven. At trial, Haywood claimed he had been acting in defense of the village, with Tennant having, quote, bewitched the cattle and land of local farmers. So, and then he said, if you had known the number of people who lie in our churchyard, who, if it had not been for witches, would have been alive now, you would be surprised. Her was a proper witch. I like his defense of, like, it's fine. She was a witch. Yep. 
like. So he was found not guilty by reason of insanity. And he, he spent the rest of his life in a psychiatric hospital for the criminally insane. Died in, 19, in 1890. Um, the method of killing, though, with the pickaxe, or not the pickaxe, the um, pitchfork, was described by Holland and Warwickshire as, quote, sticking or staking. And it is the Anglo-Saxon way of killing witches to ensure they don't rise from the grave. Hmm. Okay. It gets, like, real weird. Let me find the spot, because I think I put where to go. So, there is basically in the town at this time... There is a little bit of, you know, murmurings about how close he was connected to Anne Tennant. Mm-hmm. Um, some people believed that the relationship was distant, uh, but that Walton's first cousin, once removed was John Haynes. Haynes was married to a Sarah Cook, whose own first cousin, once removed, was Elizabeth Clifton, the wife of Anne Tennant's son. (laughs) So some people thought that that connection was enough to connect him with witchcraft. Others thought that the connection was actually closer, and they thought that Anne Tennant was his great-grandmother directly Hmm. um others still thought that he had just been introduced to witchcraft by like a servant girl who bewitched cattle it's vague it's all legend wait this is this is trying to connect charles walton to Anne Tennant. right but like he also might have just been, like, interested in local true crime. Exactly. <laughs> like. Yeah. This happened in his area. Right. So, in another passage of one of the books, the, the this one is called The Old Customs and Superstitions in Shakespeare Land. There was another page that was marked, and the page talked about a story of how in 1885... A boy had encountered a black dog on Mm -hmm. nine successive days. On the last occasion, the dog was in the company of a headless woman. That same night, the boy's (laughs) sister died. So, local folklore, as we talked about, they talk about these black phantom dogs roaming the area, being a harbinger of death. But the, the interesting thing is that... In the story, the boy's name was Charles Walton. Okay. So he does have a sister who passed away, but not that sister. Like, the the story's not about him, though. That's weird. Because obviously he adopted his niece. Yeah. But... Well, he adopted his niece 30 years ago when he was, what, 40-something? Yeah. Right. He's not a boy. Yep. So eventually, after all of this, uh, Detectives Fabian and Webb went back to London. Uh, They left Detective Spooner to continue investigating, but the trail went cold. Did they, like, look at fingerprints on the pitchfork or the walking stick? It only talks about the one weapon. I just feel like there's more, there's evidence that points to the boss mm-hmm. and I feel like they're like well it's unsolved just because like they didn't try very hard <laughs> yep um but the the trail went cold they they never solved the case um interestingly enough Charles Happy Bachelor uh quit working for Mr. Potter he wasn't getting paid yeah probably not <laughs> Um, despite all of the evidence against Potter, every bit of it was circumstantial. There was nothing physical linking him to the crime. No witnesses. Uh, 
at one point a pair of pants that Potter had worn on the day of the case believed to contain blood stains, um, but they had been cleaned well enough to not be able to make any analysis if that was the case. Uh, nobody thought that he was capable of such violence, nor that there was a fight between the two. Okay. Uh, so that was really it. Um, a lot of people... So, oh, and then in 1960, so what, 15 years later, mm -hmm. um, they were doing some demolition behind the cottage. They had outhouses back there, and a workman discovered Walton's watch in one of the outhouses. Um, it had been searched at the time of the murder, meaning that whenever the watch was dropped there, it was later after the investigation and that's so, behind the cottage he lived in yep that was behind his cottage okay uh but uh, that little bit of evidence didn't lead anywhere um people still thought that he was just a warlock who practiced dark magic um there was one woman where like i don't even know how she decided to like add her little hot take in <laughs> um but <laughs> Uh, Egyptologist, Egyptologist, Dr. Margaret Murray, what? <laughs> the president of the Folklore Society from 1953 to 55 said that she believed Walton had been sacrificed as part of a fertility ritual by those still practicing pre-Christian paganism. Uh, and while her work in Egyptology and archaeology was very widely acclaimed, her theories on witchcraft have primarily been rejected and debunked. I hate to, like, I don't know, I hate to tear down a fellow archaeologist, <laughs> yeah. especially a female archaeologist, but, like, what? Yeah. Stay in your lane. Yeah. Stay in your lane. Like, I'm not, I'm not veering into Egyptological, like, theories. Yeah. That's not my field. And then get out, get out of this lane, lady. And then those who thought that, um, base some people thought basically that they had had a blight of their crops, a failed harvest in the in 1944, and then the death of Potter's heifer was just too much on the village, and they decided to enact a rite of blood sacrifice letting the blood of the witch replenish and or replenish and cleanse the soil so that's why it you know was referred to as the witchcraft murder um because of all this folklore surrounding it here's here's my next question mm -hmm. after his death did the did the crops get better i don't know I don't Ooh, know. Ow. I just kicked the space here. So if you go to your slides here, the next slide, I have some newspaper clippings that you can check out. Okay. Um, and then the last slide is Peter Fabian. So um Oh, and he's in this uh Yeah. This, this uh what's it called? Help me. The clipping newspaper clipping as well. Yeah. Peter Fabian. He looks like the kind of guy who would be like, it was all witchcraft. Right. I like here it says about, like, Detective Superintendent Fabian saw a black dog run past. Yeah. <laughs> like, it sounds like there was a bunch of dogs in this village. Yeah. So why are they so surprised? I don't know. Wow. But that is the case of the pitchfork murder. What what is the the machete hook thing called again? A bill hook. B i l l. Hook? Yes. Mm hmm. Okay. So it's like a shorter machete, kind of. Yeah, and it, it's curved at the top. Yeah, so it's 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 like a handheld. Like one-handed version of like a sickle, basically. How you I would use say, a sickle to sweep to cut down hay. This is like a one-handed kind of I, tool. For I that. was gonna say it's sort of like a sickle, like yeah. a short, 
sick sickle. Right. Okay. Yeah, well, I had to look up what it looked like myself. Because it's like, we all know what pitchforks look like. Well, when but... you said it was like a machete, I was like, well, why do they call it a hook? And then, like, in this thing, this uh, newspaper clipping, they call it a hedge-slashing hook. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like. Yeah, because when I saw Bill Hook, I was like, like, my head initially was like, was it like a shepherd's hook? Like, what? Yeah, like, how did they stab him with that? Yeah, yeah exactly. But. I think it was the boss. I think so, too. I think he had, I I would bet that. Charles found out about the money and confronted him about it and whether or not it was like a a negative confrontation I think it spooked him yeah I think that like he was working on the hill and Potter you know approached and was like hey what's up like how you doing right and he was like hey can I talk to you about this like I only have two dollars to my name for some reason. Uh, yeah. When are we getting paid? Yeah. Yeah. I also think, like, people that are like, he's not capable of that kind of thing. Like, you don't know what he's capable of. No. And I don't think his alibis hold any water. And I think it's weird that he was like, well, I touched it. Even though he was the one keeping Edith from touching things. Like, it was him. Right. I think it was him. I think... <sighs> Kind of like what we talked about, because we we talked about it kind of with Diane Downs, where, like, her dad is still adamant that she didn't do it. Like, I think anyone can just get this preconceived notion in their head that, like, someone is incapable of doing a thing. That doesn't mean that they actually are. Yeah. Yeah. And, like, these townspeople are the ones saying that, like, he's not capable of that, but, like, Do you really know your neighbors? Right. Like, who knows? I don't think it was some sort of weird pagan ritual. No. I I don't. It was was certainly somebody. I feel like with the throat slashing, it's like you, you want to stop a person from talking. Yeah. You know? Mm hmm. Like, that is like the way that that crime happened somebody was angry like big angry yeah also this uh this one newspaper clipping talks about uh who put bella in the witch elm Mm. it says about uh his investigations his investigations into this and an equally bizarre murder of a woman whose skeleton was found in a hollow tree at Hagley, Worcestershire in 1943 uncover a surprising history of witchcraft in the Cotswold countryside. Mm-hmm. So there's another fun little Easter egg for those yeah. of you who know the Bella and the Witch Elm story. Yeah. It was the boss. Case closed. I think so. <laughs> I think it's pretty clear. Um, So, for the monthly mystery, we don't do our reading and recommended. Partially because these are usually, like, for a while there were double recording days, so we had already done it. But also because, like, we do that every time and these are different. Right. So, this time we're going to talk about our goals for the year for this podcast. Yeah. Sort of, like, letting you guys in on on what we want to happen this year. Yeah. Basically, my goal for the year is to get a, like, consistent (laughs) routine going with, like, recording, editing, all of that. I have a page in my bullet journal. Liz and I both bullet Mm -hmm. journal. I have a page in my bullet journal that is podcast related. And it is, like, the episode, um, it's basically, like, just a checklist. Like, it gets recorded. It gets edited. I make the brief. I put up the... Uh, stuff for Liz to use for like mm-hmm. TikTok and, and YouTube and stuff and then I had like post it but I don't have like a like a set thing of like when stuff gets done and mm-hmm. I always feel like I'm rushing to get things finished and post it on time so I just want to kind of like I don't know like get stuff in a routine I want to get in a routine it's also kind of hard because the library is still not open 
Mm -hmm. So I haven't been working at the library, so I don't really have like a schedule as far as that goes. So it's kind of thrown off my schedule for other things too. Yeah. But that's my main goal. And then my other goal is to get YouTube updated and, and running smoothly. Yeah, but I'm working on that. Yeah, which I like. Yeah. I'm glad. That's my my first goal for the year is to do that. So um, we've been talking about, you know, changes that we want to make and, and things we want to work up to. And one of the changes beyond just getting YouTube caught up is that I'm working on getting the videos made so that the photos from our slides are in the videos. Which so, I think is a great idea. Yeah. So if you watch on YouTube, then you'll see the photos as we're talking about them. Um, the... The only thing with that is YouTube is our smallest audience. Mm -hmm. We have like eight subscribers on YouTube and half of them are us or our friends. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so that is definitely our platform that we see the least amount of reach on. Mm -hmm. um, so even if you don't want to listen on YouTube, we would even appreciate if you just went and gave us the subscribe You'll mm -hmm. see the videos pop up on your subscription page every week. Um, but, of course, by all means, listen wherever you want to listen. Um, but so that's one thing is getting YouTube all caught up. Hopefully, um, once we get caught up with it and once we are getting to a better point as far as reach on YouTube, we might look into incorporating a like video of us having our conversation. Um, but of course that's like step four <laughs> down yeah. the line. So we'll see how, how that goes. Um, but I mean, we want to make everything easier, not only for us, but for you guys as well. Um, yeah, and we want to give you options, right? Options of how you want to interact with the podcast, um, because that's I think like not everybody likes to listen or 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 view media the same way. So we want right. to give you we want to give you options of ways to do things. Yeah, like I know personally, I prefer to watch podcasts on YouTube where there's a video, but um. But then I know people who don't. So, you know, just giving those options to you guys is nice. So. Yeah. Do we want to do, now that we've done, like, our, our main goals, do we want to do, like, our stretch goal? Like, a big a big Ooh. goal that we'd like to have? Yeah. Which one do you want to, do you want to say? Um, I think we can both I, pick one. I would like, by the end of the year, to have a Patreon page yeah. for us. Um, not only because then we could like make a little bit of money and put it toward the like making the podcast better. Getting better microphones would be so nice. We're using like thirty dollar microphones. Yeah, better mics would be good, and also like just I don't know, just just improving things for everyone. Yeah. And I also think with the with the Patreon, I think it would just be fun because it's a way, another way to interact with our audience. Yes, directly and like give them bonus. Uh, content and things that are a bit more uh, personality based. Yeah, we can, we can get to know you guys because you listen to us and get to know us, but we don't know you. We don't know right. you guys. Like, I want to be able to interact with our audience more. Yeah, yeah, I think that's probably the nicest one. And of mm -hmm. course, we understand that we need to develop a certain base. Yeah. Before that we, can happen. We behind the scenes have like a number <laughs> yeah. of like when when that's going to happen. But yeah. I think I would like it to happen before the end of the year. I think that would be fantastic. I think that would really be ideal. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to jinx us, <laughs> but I think that would be ideal. Do you what is your what, what is your uh, stretch goal you'd like to talk about? Uh, my stretch goal would be, and this, this I think is a farther long shot. I think mm -hmm. this would be more like a five year goal, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> um, but it kind of plays off the Patreon thing. I think it would be great to be able to outsource some of our work. Ugh. 
Because yes. it's a lot of work for something that we, you know, we enjoy doing it. That's yes. why we are doing this is because we enjoy making the podcast. So I don't want it to seem like, oh, God, we hate it. Because we don't. complaining. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, to be able to pay someone else, you know, add to, you know, somebody else, add to the team. Um, and I think it would really streamline things. I think it would be more consistent and easier you know, any any big podcast you see, they're not editing their stuff themselves, no. you know. So that would be my big one, but I don't expect to hit that this year. No, I don't think so either. Yeah. But we can dream. Yeah, in a perfect world. Yeah. So. Um, Elizabeth. Yes, Hannah. Where can the people find us? We are Briefcase Crimes across all platforms. You can find us on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, and YouTube. You can listen to full episodes anywhere that you listen to your podcasts. If you would like to support us monetarily, you can buy us a coffee on ko-fi.com forward slash briefcase crimes. Or you can purchase any of our book recommendations or the books that we talk about on the show from our affiliate link on bookshop.org that is bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash briefcase crimes they support local bookstores by donating 70 percent of profits to them and they support us through our affiliate link by giving us 10 percent of the profits as well that link as well as all of the other links that i mentioned are in our link tree which can be found in the description of the episode and in our bio links as well well said. I get better every time. <laughs> you sure do. <laughs> um, I will say, I edited the Weepy Voice Killer and was, like, cracking up yeah. when I when I left and you did that. And you were like, and this is where Hannah usually says, well, well said. And I say, thank you. And, like, had this whole thing <laughs> and then just started reading me memes. <laughs> it was it was fantastic. I really highly appreciated uh, it. No problem. And I'm probably going to keep this in because in that episode, I did keep in the uh, you telling me that you left me a surprise. Oh. So that was the surprise, everyone. Okay. I see. <laughs> yep. The surprise was me just rambling, <laughs> waiting for it. her to get back. But. I enjoyed it. Yeah, I'm glad. I mean, it was meant to brighten your day, so. It did. Good. It did. I love any sort of nuggets for me when I'm editing. Yeah. By the way, editing Hannah, we love you. Yes, you are so perfect and special. Go get yourself a drink of water. Oh, yes. And a coffee. Oh, definitely. And then get this episode finished, please. It's probably late. (laughs) (laughs) Please get this. I believe in you. I think you're on time. I don't. <laughs> we'll see. When you're yeah. editing this, text text Liz and let us know, are you on time or are you late? I'll be waiting for it. Yes. Um, Elizabeth? Yes, Hannah? Would you like to wrap this up? I would. As always, thank you guys so much for listening. And we will see you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.